So here to talk about the plight of the honeybee, Please welcome senior writer at Time Magazine, Brian Walsh, president of the National Resources Defense Council, Francis Beinecke, and University of Maryland entomologist, Dennis Van Eaglesdorp. Nice to see you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, I know, Dennis, you have been on the front lines watching this happen since 2006. So, in simple terms, can you describe what the phenomenon colony collapse disorder is? Right. So, colony collapse disorder is a very specific set of symptoms that we see with dying bees. Or what we see is the bees leave that colony very quickly. So, tens of thousand bees leave within two weeks, leaving behind their young bees or their brood, sometimes the queen and all their food. And we didn't understand why they were leaving so quickly. Having said that, I want to emphasize that we haven't found bees dying with those set of symptoms for about three years now. But bees are still dying at 30% every winter. And so it's brought our attention to the fact that bees just don't seem to be able to survive in our environment. And we need to know why. Brian, I know Time Magazine devoted its cover to this issue last August. So why should the average person care about this? Well, as you heard in that video, I mean, about one out of every three mouthfuls of food that you'll have today sort of involved commercial honeybees. They pollinated those crops. And that includes apples, almonds, berries, cucumbers. I mean, we could be here all day if I just went down the alphabetical list of all those crops. And really, I think, you know, they're a backbone part of a commercial agriculture. I mean, just this past spring, you needed to send billions and billions of honeybees to California to pollinate the almond crop, you know, a $1.5 billion crop really wouldn't exist without those honeybees. And, and Francis, what does the disappearance of these honeybees say about the state of the environment in your view? I think, Katie, what it really says is the environment is troubled. There are lots of reasons for that. But when we see honeybees dying, those are the honeybees that are managed by beekeepers. What about all the natural pollinators out there? Is the same thing happening to them? How extensive is this die-off? We need to get to the bottom of it and find out why and try to solve the problem. It also has some serious economic ramifications. Absolutely. $15 billion of our agriculture industry depends on pollinators and on, on honeybees that provide that. That puts our food at risk. It really raises a very significant food security issue for the country. What if we can't grow our own food and have to import it? How will that look in the future? So, Dennis, as you've been studying this, have you figured out, are there theories about why this is happening? We now don't think that there's one single cause to explain bee losses. We think it's, it's basically three different things. First, there's a whole bunch of diseases bees can get. The primary one of them are these large vampire mites that suck the blood of bees and also introduce viruses to the bees. And we actually think that that's probably the reason that bees are showing the symptoms of mortality. What we don't understand altogether is why the bees are so predisposed to these diseases. And so that is probably a combination of pesticides, both beekeepers applied to try to uh, control varroa mite, but also pesticides that farmers are using. Um, and, and they're bringing back to the hive, weakening the bees' immune system. Another really important factor is lack of forage. We've seen with the increased demand for corn and soybeans, huge millions of acres being converted from what used to be prime forage land for bees into corn and soybean fields. And so there's nowhere for bees to get the food they need to survive. So when you say forage land, Dennis, what does that mean exactly? I mean, what yeah. was there before the crops? So for instance, in the Dakotas, where a lot of the colonies go, for the summer to fatten up for the winter. That used to be a lot of prairies and meadows and fallow land that, that farmers didn't plow under because you couldn't produce a real good corn crop there. But with the increased price of corn, farmers are now planting corn in that same land. Commercial beekeeper Dave Hackenberg is here. We saw him in the piece. And, and Dave, how hard is it for you to lose bees at this alarming rate? Because after all, this is your livelihood. I've been keeping bees for 52 years, and it's like losing part of your family. Mm. You know, these are your livelihood. This is what put my four kids through college, you know. Uh, you go out there, and they're missing, you know. It's like having your kids go missing, you know. Where did they go? And, and what do you think about the mystery? I mean, what do you think is responsible for, for this? Well, a lot of things have changed, you know. I've, 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 keeping bees for 50-some years, you know, and I've seen a lot of changes, but in the last number of years, we've seen a lot of changes in our our agriculture programs and our urban programs, especially in our pesticide programs, you know, we've gone from using hard chemicals that basically killed bugs to now poisoning plants. 
I'm gathering that these pesticides, in your view, are weakening the bees, making them more susceptible to other diseases, which are threatening them. Certainly it's one of the contributing factors. There are other pesticides involved too, but certainly this is a leading suspect. And Jay Broom is the president of Crop Life America. It's the largest national trade organization representing the agricultural pesticide industry. And Jay, what is the industry's position on this? By way of background, I'm also from a family farming operation in the Midwest. So I really get you know, the concerns of beekeepers and farmers alike. Uh, while we're working for the industry that produces crop protection products. Uh, so we're committed as an industry to continuing to invest in research, to work collaboratively with uh, university researchers like Dennis and many others, as well as the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and EPA. You know, we're as concerned about the health of bees because they are so important for all of agriculture. Our companies are also involved in plant genetics, and I'll just give you one example. One of the major alfalfa research companies is Land of Lakes, a member company of, of Crop Life America. Uh, they've developed a new uh, breed of alfalfa that blooms earlier in the plant's life and actually provides additional forage for bees that otherwise wouldn't be there with uh, the conventional alfalfas grown mainly for cattle feed, uh, dairy cow uh, feed and the like. Well it seems Francis that there are efforts underway but do you think enough is being done about this problem? Well I really think Katie that ultimately the government has to take responsibility to ensure that our food supply is protected. In Europe they've banned a class of pesticides that are used and that are suspect in this area called neonics for short. Uh, we think the United States should seriously consider that. We need to do research, we need to find out what the source of this problem is. To the extent that pesticides are a contributing factor, we need to regulate them. Brian, you've studied this extensively. What do you think the solution is? Well, I think the solution is gonna be a whole number of different answers, really. I mean, we need to deal with pesticides, both in terms of the ones we allow, but also in terms of how they're used. We also have to think about how we farm. You know, we now are producing huge amounts corn, soybeans, because those crops are so uh, valuable to farmers, and that's you know eliminating the sort of forage territory bees used to have. And then things that we can do, individuals actually, we can plant bee-friendly gardens. You know, we can plant that forage land that, that the bees would want, and frankly, we can even keep bees ourselves, which I think a number of people are beginning to do. Right, in fact, we're gonna be talking about that next, but Brian, thank you so much, Francis, also Dennis, Dave and Jay, thanks so much for being here and talking about it. It's a fascinating topic and uh, I think one that we all need to pay much closer attention to.